Okay. Cool. So I'm Jane. I'm based in Chesterfield, North Derbyshire. I don't know if anyone knows where that is. It's near Sheffield. Um, I studied film production at the University of Derby and graduated in 2018. See You Again was my first non-student sort of semi-professional short film, but no one was paid. It was all voluntary. I filmed it early 2019 and it was publicly released February 2021. Um, I filmed my second short film in October 2020. So with this talk, I don't really want to like be talking about myself because I don't really find myself that interested. <laughs> um, so I've sort of set it out as like a blueprint for you to do your own film. And there will be clips of See You Again. So by the end of the presentation, you will have seen the full film, hopefully. Oh, sorry. I got the host of spotlighted your video, so I got distracted. Anyway. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about pre-production, production, and then post-production, and just using See You Again as an example. So See You Again is 12 minutes. It follows the story of a mother trying to reconnect with her daughter after she became too busy for her. It was a two-day shoot filmed in two locations. I set it all at night because I just like pain. I'm kidding. Majority of the film is two actors until the last couple of scenes. Post-production took around nine months, including the grade and composition. And in total, I spent less than 300, but probably more than 200 on the film. So this is the trailer. Shall we stay up late tonight? I love you so much. I love you too. Okay, so I wrote, directed and produced this short film. I initially wanted to find someone else to produce alongside with me, but it was hard to find anyone else who wasn't already tied to a project. I left uni wanting to be a director and writer and I had produced before and it wasn't bad, but after this film, like being a sole producer, it made me realize that one, I can produce and two, it's not that bad. When it's like you're working with the right team, it's fine. So. Um, I don't know how it works with you guys because I know you're quite like a tiny group and it's, you know, you, you like doing the amateur stuff. You're not aiming to be like professional learning from it. But if you do want to find a director, writer or producer, the best way I found to find crew is on Facebook, to be honest. There's many like, you know, there's like shooting people on Mandy that have crew options, but Facebook is just the best place, I think, to find people who enjoy doing just voluntary work. They just like doing passion projects and other people, you know, it is a hobby for a lot of people. So if you're looking for a director, I would ask for any previous examples they have just to see if it's the right style and interest you want. If you're looking for a writer, specify the genre you want. And also if there's any particular means or messages you want in that film and ask to see spec scripts, which is basically just a portion of the script to see if you like their writing. If you're looking for a producer who are like the hardest to find, it's best to, again, depending like how professional you want it, I would probably look for people who have maybe graduated or people who have just gotten into it as well because with voluntary work, it's very hard to find someone who has enough experience that doesn't want to be paid. So I would recommend that for if you're looking for any of those roles. So for me, I chose to do See You Again because basically my projection that I want is I want to do three short films that are unpaid and just voluntary to then be able to use them as a sort of portfolio for funding eventually. So eventually I do want to go to funding. And with the scripts, with short scripts, I think it's important to think about, does it have a relatable message? Can you afford it? And can you source locations? Because if you can't, I would say relatable message is important if you want people to talk about it and if you want people to share it. Obviously, can you afford it? You know, if you can't afford somewhere like a grand hall for a ballroom scene, then you probably don't want to include that scene in the film or just shoot a different film that you can afford. And can you source for locations? It's, 
it's locations are just the bane of my producing existence, but I'll talk more about them. <laughs> <laughs> so here on, we'll assume that you've got like the script, the producer and the director. So <laughs> I don't know if this will interest you guys, but this is just more about the paperwork that you would have to do, depending again, how like professional you want to do it. So you've got the script breakdowns, which are just basically a breakdown of every single scene that you've got. So it'll be how many actors are there? What location is it? What props are specifically specified in that scene that you're gonna to need to source? And it just basically acts like a blueprint. So when you're then producing that, you can just look at it on at a scene by scene basis and think, okay, so I need these actors for this location for this day. I need this prop bring in here. And that's what script breakdowns are used for. Using the script breakdown, you can also make the budget breakdown, which, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, but it's just like how much things will cost. What do you need to buy? Shooting script is basically a lined script. <laughs> that doesn't really specify it if you don't know what that is. It's the shots basically. So, you know, do you want a mid shot for this bit, a close up for this line? That's what a shooting script is. Is there any like software or tools that you use to do your breakdown with? Uh, um, oh, you can't see my mouse. So if you look on those pictures I've got, those are basically my own templates. I just use my own. Um, I can share them if you want me to share them. But if, if you just Googled script breakdown uh, template, you'll get examples and you can just copy that format basically. So that's basically what I did is I just looked at examples and then just took relevant bits from them and then just made my own table. Um, okay. Budget breakdown again, it's just Google and then just take, just take bits, bits from the ones you need. You know, you don't need to worry about, I don't know, like location department, like you don't need to worry about that. So just take the relevant bits from the budget breakdown templates and apply it to you mm -hmm. and what's relevant to you. So I always kind of think about the rough dates as well in this stage, like it's really early on, like I haven't got career, I haven't got locations, but I think about realistically, when do I want to film it? Um, with See You Again, from the point of starting pre-production, I gave myself two months to film well, to actually like, yeah, the film filmed. And yeah, so obviously we'll see you again as well. It features a child. So I knew that we would have to film on a weekend because it's a child actor. So they couldn't film in the weekday. And because no one's getting paid, no kid is gonna come out of school for unpaid work. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, and this is scene one. So location scouting. <laughs> so in this film, it only had two locations. It had a house and a road. The road was relatively easy to find because it was set at night. You know, I didn't need to use a busy road. I didn't need to think about, oh, how bu busy will this road be at this time? Because we would be filming after 9 p.m. and I knew we'd be filming after 9 p.m. So the house there. <laughs> so initially I was gonna film at a friend's house However, a week before the shoot, we bailed. So then I had a week to find the house location. And this is why locations are just the bane of my existence is because if they bail, you, you literally just have to scramble and try to find replacements. Um, for the road, oh, luckily though with the house. So we, I lost the house location. So I was like, you know, I've got the child actor that child is part of an acting group. So maybe the mother of that child actor will know someone who has used their house before as a filming location. So I asked the child actor's mother if she knew anywhere and she was just like, oh, well, you can use ours. So we use the child actor's house for the house scenes. And it was a really nice house to be fair. It used to be a B&B. &B, so every room, every bedroom had an ensuite. 
it was really nice. So for the road, we basically just used an unused public road. And instead of driving down the road or having another car approach a vehicle, we had all us crew apart from the DOP and sound operator who were in the car emanating the road. So me and the production designer were rocking the car back and forth. We had the runner swinging a light to make it look like street lights. And we had the assistant director with um, they're called spotlights. They're a type of film light where it's those circular ones. And he basically just had to time it right and then just swing them towards the car. <laughs> so that's how he did the road scene for scene one. So yeah. Great. So this is advice. So when working on low budget, it's best to be transparent with location. So if you can't afford a um, deposit or payment, uh, you just have to just be transparent. Uh, just be transparent about that. It's best to approach people you know and people you trust that won't bail. Um, and if you approach them with a rough idea of dates, then you can find locations that are free on those dates that you've mentioned, which saves a lot of time and scheduling. If you can't find what you're looking for, it's best to use groups like groups in Facebook and post in filmmaking groups and just ask for advice and see if anyone else has filmed in a similar setting to your scene and what their solution was and where they filmed. Um, it's unrealistic to expect that you can build a set when you're doing a passion project. So take this into account when you're deciding which script that you want to adapt. Okay, so crewing up. So I've got the dates. So, you know, I've like source locations, I've got the dates. So now I'll finish crewing up. Um, most of the time when I'm doing my productions, I'll already have in mind who I want to approach and ask who, you know, like I want to work with this DOP. So I'll ask them one, if they're interested and two, if they're potentially free in this time and then just see when they're potentially free. So the crew that was on See You Again was me, the producer, writer, and director, the first assistant director, uh, the direct, director of photography, which is the camera operator, sound, runner, makeup artist, production designer, editor, composer, and film poster designer. Um, my advice when crewing up, if you're working on a tight budget, a lot of people operate using what's termed skeleton crews. So they're basically just the bare bones needed to make film. So for me, I would say a skeleton crew is made up of producer, writer, director, director of photography, camera operator, sound, and an editor. That's who I would say you just need to cover those roles. And though there's only a few of you, you should be okay. So scene two. Mom? Shall we stay up late tonight? Can I? Just for tonight. Why? I just thought it'd be nice to do something. Yes, we could watch anything I wanted tonight. You were late again. I know. I'm sorry. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want a hug? <laughs> Go on then. Shall we draw? 
Yeah. That bought me some new crayons. Did, did everyone see that okay? Did it work for everyone? Yeah. Yeah, it worked for me. Cool. Cool. Panic not. I know it's really hard talking into a void when everybody's silent, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping if, if anyone did, maybe maybe they'll just put it in the chat. So just let me know if anyone sees it. Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on it for you. Hey, cheers. Thank you. So the casting. So I cast you again using mostly Facebook groups. I did put out um, calls on like a site called Shooting People and Mandy, but I just kept getting people from London. And obviously I can't afford expenses for anyone coming from London. So Facebook was just the best place to use, I think. It's Facebook, it's like a lot of people on there, they are hobbyists. They, they're fine doing passion projects because they do it just because they enjoy it. They don't want to be making like, you know, thousands of pounds of every film they do. So all the cast auditioned apart from the second policeman who you'll see later, but I think you just see his shoulder. Um, and he was actually the production designer. So <laughs> yeah, he got roped into that role. But yeah, all you see is his shoulder to be honest. So, so um, for me personally, I know a lot of people will cast a short film like in the early stages. However, I only tend to cast when I have dates confirmed because it just makes things easier to schedule instead of trying to arrange it around everyone when they have free dates. So this way it just saves a lot of hassle and you will only get applicants who can do those days. You know, cause it's like, there's so many times where it's like, you try to arrange with an actor, but then they aren't free when these are free. So then you have to recast anyway. So. Personally, I just do it when the dates are confirmed. For volunteer work, I prefer to ask for self-tapes rather than in-person auditions. It's just more cost-effective and it takes less time. So I'm assuming you guys know what self-tapes are, but if you don't, it's just basically you ask the actor auditioning to perform a scene in their own time and then they just send you the video. So you can just review the video in your own time. So Mandy is a good site to use to browse cast. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Mandy, but it's literally just a cast and crew collective, basically. So if you, had, if you have a clear idea of what you're looking for, it's good to cast characters of varying diversity, but in the Midlands especially, it's hard to come by many actors from BAME or LGBT groups. So if you are someone who is like, you really want to cast someone from those groups, I feel like Mandy is just the best choice because you can search for people using Mandy and you can just filter it by, you know, like looks. So however you want, I, I, or I, I would say the mother role was the hardest one for me to cast because I just couldn't find anyone that, I guess just, I liked their performance. Like there were many people whose performance was good, but it, it was like they wouldn't match a child actor and it's like I knew I wanted to cast Isabella well Isabel um as a child actor and I couldn't find anyone who looked somewhat like Isabel but Jen Day the person who plays the mother Rachel she I actually knew her from the East Midlands um film network basically so I knew that she was good and I knew that she had good um a good reputation so she sent a self tape and I just, I just knew that she would be the one for the film. So if you do cast on Mandy though, um, some actors don't accept voluntary work and they can report your account if you contact them for voluntary work, but they will say, if you go to send a message, it will say this, this actor doesn't accept voluntary work. So it's fine. So these are the last few tips steps I took in pre-production on See You Again. Um, the order depends pretty much who you'll ask, um, but I always insure my short films. When I was at uni, I obviously didn't have to worry about insurance, but when you leave uni, 
most people will assume your short film is insured, even if it's unpaid. However, this, I would say it probably is only really detrimental if you have something that could go wrong. So for me, the casting could go wrong. You know, if it's late at night and we're on an, what we think is an empty road, but then someone just comes booming down it because they're going at like 70 or whatever. I just needed to have that insurance there in case, because basically when, when you're in the producer role, you just have to think what could go wrong. <laughs> and even if it's somewhere just far out there, you just have to think what could go wrong. And even if it's low, I just, you don't want to take the risk. Um, I assume you all know what risk assessments and everything are. But again, yeah. it's like most people will assume you've done those before they come onto the film. So insurance usually costs between 90 to 100 and I get the covers for employer liability and public liability. And yeah, as we had the scene on the road, that was why I uh, got the insurance. Props. <laughs> so with See You Again, the only props were a drawing that Ellie does and the lanyard around Rachel's neck. So it, I didn't have to spend much money on props. When you're working on no budget, most of the props will come from your house or just a crew member's house anyway. So it's like, if you need, oh, I need a vase, a vase with flowers. One of your crew would probably have a vase and then you just need to find some flowers. <laughs> so yeah, you just work with what you have really when it's low budget stuff. So I finalized the shot list and created the shooting schedule with that. The shooting schedule, self-explanatory, but it's just, um, you can see in the top screenshot, that's the shooting schedule for my second short film. And it's just basically step-by-step. Step. This is how much time I've got for this shot. This is the next shot. This is how much time we have for this one. When will crew arrive? When will cast arrive? And it's just basically everything set out with times. And then from the shooting schedule, you can make what's called a call sheet. I assume you guys know what they are. Yeah. Um, if you don't, it's basically just a form telling everyone when to get to set and what's happening on this day. That's uh, the call sheet is the bottom screenshot there. Again, I can send templates if people want them. Um, just, just let me know really. Uh, yeah, so that's it. The call sheet is sent to everyone on the crew so the cast and crew are all sent the call sheet i always send everyone the shooting schedule as well anyway but no one probably reads it <laughs> but yeah call sheet everyone gets sent that so catering i always arrange well most producers and directors will arrange catering for lunch on the shooting days um for see you again i just made everyone pasta because that's just the go-to indie film set meal <laughs> Um, arrange transport, to cut down costs for expenses where you can, it's good to car share. However, with COVID that has been impacted. So with my second short film, I filmed that just before the third lockdown. So the guidelines at that time stated that for work purposes, which volunteer is classed, up, classed as work, you can car share. So we managed, so I managed to cut down costs on that because the guidelines said we can still car share. Um, and then just go shopping and get snacks, water and bin bags. And if you have any films set at night, get like five rolls as tinfoil and self tape. So this Do you want to explain why you need the foil for night shots? Yeah. yeah. So basically you use it to cover the windows and anything that's letting natural light through, you need to cover all of it with tinfoil. So see you again. All of it was set at night. <laughs> So this poor like woman just had to watch me and the crew foil foiling up all her windows so that no natural light was getting through. And yeah, it, it just creates the atmosphere of it being nighttime. It just blocks out all the natural light. So yeah, is that okay? Great, thank you. Cool. So this is scene three. Where are you going to draw? Tell 
found you a rabbit. A rabbit? And one in the school play. Oh. What have you picked to be that? Yesterday. I was going to tell you today. I'm sorry, Ellie. Work needed me to stay later. They always want you to stay late. I know. Will you come and see the play? I don't know if I can. Okay. I like could be here. I'll play with your hair. I used to do this for you all the time when you were little. Do you remember? No. Oh. I used to do it for you all the time before I got the promotion at work. How's school? It's okay. Me and Shannon fell out today though. Why? She said it was stupid. Oh, what? what? I said I wanted a cat for Christmas. Why did you say you want a cat for Christmas? Well, you said we couldn't have a dog. <laughs> so a cat's okay. I'm sorry. Maybe you should ask your dad. Can I have one? Um, I'm not promising anything. Maybe. <laughs> really? Maybe. Shannon's probably jealous. How's that drawing coming along? Wow. That's the rabbit. Do you like it? Obviously. <laughs> I'll put it on the fridge. Cool. Did everyone manage to see that? Okay. I think so. I didn't have any uh, cry outs on my chat. <laughs> okay so now with all that done you're ready to shoot so oh we've got scene four already i forgot i put that here here's scene four <laughs> Can you hear me? You couldn't see me either. Were you hiding? No. What should we 
Use your mouth, Ellie. Cool. So production stew again had about seven drafts. The script did. It was actually called something different as well until probably the end of post-production. I'm not changing the name see you again. Uh, most of the changes I would make to the script towards the end were just tweaking the dialogue. Um, and then I would send out every draft that I had to the um, cast and crew as they came. So it's like, I wouldn't just send them all at once. Like when I finished uh, the draft number six, I would send that out. Um, and yeah, I would send it to all the cast and crew with plenty of time ahead of shooting. The crew probably didn't really care, um, but the cast would obviously need the most up-to-date script to be able to memorize the lines. Everybody has sent the call sheets. Um, I always do these ahead of the shoot day as well. But in a lot of industry productions, most people will get the call sheet the night before. Um, but I don't like doing that. So, so production. Um, this is something I did on my second short film, but will probably have to be done all the time now. Cast and crew need to fill out COVID forms before the shoot. Um, so for Stained Canvas, which was my second short, Basically a few days before filming, I had to send everyone a form where they basically just ticked off whether they had symptoms or not. If anyone said yes, we couldn't film or we'd have to recast their role. That's what we have to do now. Um, when on set, I have all cast and crew sign release forms, which um, release forms are basically just to say that these people acknowledge that this is your production and you own the copyright for it. And they just, yeah, so no one can turn around and be like, oh, that's my sound, that, that's my shots because they've signed the form, you own it, so you can do what you want with it. So I was really lucky with the equipment on CU again. So because I used to be a student at Derby Uni, so I knew students below my year and the sound operator and the camera operator were students a year below me so they were still at uni so they could get the equipment out of uni and it would be insured because they were using it and they were still part of Derby Uni. So the equipment we used was the Red Epic, um, I think it was a R26 maybe um, for the sound and the main lights we used were rotor light and also sumo lights. Most places you can probably find sumo lights. Um, I don't know how you guys source your equipment. I don't know if there's like an equipment collective or something that you guys have that you can go into or if um, you have to just find the equipment yourselves. If you do have to find it yourselves, I would always recommend working with people who own their own equipment because most of the time they'll have their own insurance for that equipment anyway if they're using it for filming. Um, so you don't have to worry about getting insurance for the equipment because they'll have it insured for themselves anyway. Mm. So uh, I like to believe that See You Again was probably 12 hours, but it might have been a bit longer. <laughs> um, we shot at the house during the day till evening, both shoot days. And after the first day of filming is when we shot the road scene. So we basically went from the house and before everyone went home, we went to the road that I had planned and filmed that scene. And then everyone could just go home ready for the next day. Um, I set the whole film at night, which, as I say, we had to foil all the windows. So that took a lot of prep time. Um, but the DOP, he, he was very on it lighting wise. So he did know how to light it. So it looked like it was all at night and it was artificial lights from like, you know, the light in the living room or something. Um, no matter the role, I think you can always learn on a film set. I graduated in June the year prior and learned a lot on CU again, things like scheduling, insurance, casting, crew calls, etc. When you're at the stage of an amateur, it's a good place to learn how you work. Like you, you don't need to feel pressurized, I think, to be industry standard because it's just a passion project. So, you know, you don't have to be sending out, like most industry standard sheets, they're easily like over three pages. You, you don't need to do that. It, it's just all you have are the basic crew. They just need the basic information. You don't need to have lists of information. This is- you, um, Oh, sorry, Jane. No, 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 carry on. I was gonna ask if you had to have any special um support or or for, for managing child actors did you have to limit their hours and things 
Yeah, they do have to limit their hours. So Isabel, uh, at the time of filming, she was actually 14, but she looks really young. Um, so she does, she can work longer hours than obviously most child actors because it's, it like works in like age range. Mm-hmm. So I think it's like, if they're below, f- I can't remember what age it is. I think it's if they're below 10, they can only work six hours a day. But because Isabel is like over 13, I think she could have worked eight hours. Right. Obviously they have breaks so. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, in terms of child license, because this comes up a lot when working with child actors, that there's basically a loophole in the wording. So you only realistically need a child license if the child is getting paid or if you are gonna make money from this film, which for most short films, voluntary, no one's getting paid. You're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna sell it on. It's not gonna get any revenue. So you don't need a child license. Right. So, yeah. Um, I luckily, the job I had at the time um, had a DBS check. So I was DBS checked, but as long as they have their guardian on set, again, there is another loophole with that. So yeah, this is scene five. There's only six scenes, by the way. So this is the second to last scene. I'm so sorry, Ellie. Sorry for what? Lots of things. It's okay. I'm so glad I got to see you again. What do you mean? Why are you crying? You need to go and get your dad, okay? He's asleep. I know. Go wake him up. Some people are gonna need to speak to him. There was actually um, a production design error that we made in that because, so the house that we filmed that, um, they have three kids and obviously in this there's only one. But if you look above the fire hearth, there's a portrait of all three kids. <laughs> but luckily no one's like brought us up on it yet. So I don't think many people have noticed. <laughs> but yeah, so post-production. After you finish shooting, um, most editors will expect that you give them a hard drive. But I remember for See You Again, the editor, Lewis, he basically just copied the footage onto his own hard drive and then just edited using his. Um, He, Lewis was like really good at just using his own intuition. So he basically just did the first rough draft by himself. I didn't have to sit with him. And then we just sat together for, I think in total, it was just four sessions and the rest he just did on his own independently. Uh, the edit session is where you'll load it, is where you'll notice a lot of continuity errors. Um, yeah, we had, that was obviously the one to see you again. Um, there were actually the biggest continuity error um, basically led to a portion being cut out. So in that scene you just watched, we cut out a portion of the conversation between Ellie and Rachel because there was a continuity error where basically Rachel had her hand on Ellie's face, but then she didn't in the other shot in the reverse of that shot. So we just cut out that entire bit. But I I don't think it's too noticeable. 
I don't think anyone would notice it unless it was pointed out. See You Again was edited on DaVinci Resolve, which I believe is free. It's a free software that you can just download. So the next stage is Composer, Foley or ADR if needed. So Composer, I like to use a Composer for my short films because they can give me original music. And again, everyone worked for free. So someone just voluntarily made music for the production. Foley and ADR, if you have like a door opening, um, I, it, my sound operator got the Foley for us. So we didn't have to use like any sound effects from YouTube. He just recorded his own. So like doors opening, keys jingling, whatever, footsteps, uh, just get that and then can underlay it in the film. ADR is if um, we needed any dubbing. So if maybe there was a dialogue line that wasn't clear, we, we would just have the actor repeat that line and send us um, voice clips. So in the last scene, which we'll see in a minute, um, the dad character basically had to send us some ADR voice clips and he just basically kept saying the line over and over again for like two minutes and then just sent it to the editor and the editor went through and picked the best line. So yeah, that's that bit. In total, see you again, took around nine months to be completed, which was quicker than I thought because, because it's voluntary. I thought it would probably take about a year. Um, just because it's when people aren't being paid for it, I don't expect them to take time out of their day or to prioritize this over paid work. Um, but yeah, took about nine months to be completed and that included ADR, Foley and composition. So the poster and teaser, um, when we had um, the picture locked, uh, I assume you guys know what that term means, picture lock. Do you, do you know no, what it is? Isn't it? Essentially, no more edits are happening. Basically, picture lock means um, you're no longer editing the video, but you're, you've got the grade and the sound design and credits probably to do. But picture lock is basically, this is a film, it just now needs to look nice, basically. Um, so after we got to that stage, um, I asked, I sent like a brief to an artist I know, who the poster is there, obviously screenshot, that's the poster. And he did it for like really reasonable rates. Um, and I, I just think his work is really nice to be fair. And the teaser, I edited the teaser. Um, it, once we had the composition, I just underlaid that and I just made it like a 10 second teaser that I could use because I'll get to why I didn't release the film publicly after I finished it in, in a minute. So after everything is done, so it's all picture locked, it's graded, sound design is done, it's the credits are done, the music is done, it's been exported. I then um, would, I put the film into my own software and just cut up the scenes and sent it to actors for their showreels. And also some crew can use it like the camera operator and me. So yeah, that's what I always do after the film's done. So this is scene six, this is the last scene. Dad. <laughs> Mum, told me to wake you up. Someone's at the door. There's been an accident. Boom. And that I see you again. Those feet in that last shot were the runner. And I think it was me <laughs> just running in the background. 
Um, so festivals. So the reason why See You Again wasn't released publicly as soon as we finished it was because there's a lot of festivals out there who they don't want the film to be public yet because they basically just want people to be attracted to the festival to be able to see, you know, films for the first time. So while See You Again was on its festival run, um, we didn't release it publicly. So I figured out my own method for festivals through this film. Basically, uh, with my graduation film, I had a really unsuccessful time with festivals. So when I got to this film and it was time to apply to festivals, I tried a different strategy. So because this didn't have a budget, I basically approached festivals that were either just starting out or had maybe just been around for a few years because that way there wouldn't be as much competition to get in. So all of these festivals on here, the only one that I think is probably really popular is the liftoff sessions, but they're just monthly things basically. So if you apply to smaller festivals with your smaller film, because it's unlikely that an amateur film is going to get into somewhere like Cannes or Raindance. It's just unlikely because you're up against people who have like higher budgets than yours, like in the thousands. So when applying to these smaller festivals, um, if you win an award at the end of the day, no matter how big that film festival is, your film is an award winning film. So you again won two awards. It won best performance and it won me a young filmmaker award. So I think it did quite well. I applied it to, I think it was nine festivals in total and it got into seven. So it, it did quite well for my first short film as well. And obviously because of COVID, the reason why I didn't get into the other two was because they were canceled um, because of COVID. So yeah. So I don't know if you guys are interested in applying your short films to festivals, but they're, they're a fun thing to do, I think. And you basically use a site called Film Freeway. And I, I probably didn't spend more than 50 pound applying this to any of these festivals. In total, it would probably just been about 50 quid. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So just what I learned from this film is how to produce films at a low budget, how to gather cast and crew for unpaid positions, how to schedule, realistic post-production expectations and festival strategies. We're done. <laughs> Lovely, <laughs> thank you. Can I jump in straight away by saying that I think that was a fantastic film. Congratulations, it deserved everything that it won, I thought. Thank you. I've got a stack of things I would love to ask you. And, and as I've got the, the floor at the moment, I'll jump in with one of them. Um, you, you said you, apart from four hours, the editor was left to his or her own devices. Did the finished product end up the way that you wanted it to, the way you'd envisaged it, or would you have done it differently if you had had more control over editing? I think it turned out pretty much the way I wanted, to be honest. I, I don't like spending too much time looking at the film because if I look at it for too long, I'm just going to notice all its flaws and imperfections. So I liked that I had an editor who could just use his own intuition and could just edit it how he could. And then when we would have those edit sessions, there were times where I was like, oh, can you change this for this shot? Can you put this shot in? Can you get rid of that shot? And yeah, my favorite shot actually was one that I asked the editor to put in, which was in the second scene, Rachel walks to Ellie's bed and there's a wide shot where it's like Ellie on the right and then Rachel on the left with the lamp behind Rachel. And that's probably my favorite shot of the entire film. And that was one shot that the editor just missed out when he went through for the first draft. And I just asked to put in. So yeah, it was, I think, probably better than what I first had. Um, I just saw a question. Should I answer questions now or do you, are we happy? Whatever you want, whatever you're comfortable. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, cool. How do I get to the chat? <laughs> <laughs> um, I can read it out for you. It says, hi, this is a question for Jane. Have you worked in the TV film industry before becoming a filmmaker yourself? If so, how did you get into the industry? Thank you, Holly. So a lot of my, yeah, so I have. I've worked on Darkest Hour, um, the Winston Churchill film. Uh, an adaption of The Worst Witch that I think is on CBBC. 
there was a, there's a few indie films I've worked on, but I think those two are probably the most that people would know. I've also worked in uh, reality shows. I worked on one called Snack Masters, season one of that, but I don't think it was that popular to be honest. Um, but yeah, yes, but how I got into them, basically uni. Um, the, uh, what was it? Darkest Hour, the location manager for that basically contacted our uni and just asked if there was anyone who wanted experience in the location department. So I got on that through that. But the reality show one, there's a site called, I think it's called Talent Manager. And basically uh, production managers can use that site to browse profiles. And this production manager just happened to find mine. And so he called me and he was just like, are you free to do a week of filming and then more if you know you want to do more? And yes, yeah, so talent manager, I would recommend. Uh, just build up your profile, basically. Great, thank you. 